Hey, what's happening, everybody? Welcome to the Pocket Razors channel, and welcome to another episode of Pocket Talk. Tonight, we've got another very special guest with us. Let's bring him on here and introduce him. Hey, we've got Mr. Roll Shambo from the Roll Shambo channel here. How you doing, Rolls? I'm a fantastic pocket razors. We've been talking about getting together on one of these for a while. Been a minute. Um, and you know, I've got it. You said you wanted to <laughs> share it with me. Look at you, dude. To- yeah. What so flavor? Not- what what flavor did you go with? Are we going chocolate chip, peanut butter? What'd you go with? Peanut butter. Okay. Peanut butter. Solid dude. If you want to if you want to know the way to my heart, it's most likely through a peanut butter cookie. Yes, yes. We had we had tossed that around a fair amount. So, so yeah, no. Uh, so, somehow, some way, I got into one of your lives early on, and um, I think I, I I came in late, and you guys were talking about not liking raisins. So I was like, oh man, don't hate on my oatmeal raisin cookie. Next thing I know, we've got a we've got a cookie conspiracy going on. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Uh, it's all good though. It's all good though. So, uh, thank you very much for taking time out of your schedule to, to come in and do an episode of this pocket talk. We have been talking about it for a while and, um, just trying to coordinate schedules is taking a minute, but I'm glad we finally managed. Um, as you probably know, uh, what we like to do here on pocket talk is we like to give you a chance to kind of tell your story, um, about kind of where, how did you get, um, into the EDC, the knife community, where did that start? Did it start as a young child, Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts? You know, what is that story? There's so much of EDC and the knife related story um, for most of us that started long before we ever ended up in this community, right? Um, and or even decided to start a channel, you know, and and uh, would love for you to to uh, tell us, uh, you know, who is Roll Shambo? How, how, how did Roll Shambo and the channel and the personality come to be? Where did that all start? And uh, I'll take the dangerous step of saying the mic is yours, my man. Have at her. And uh, you tell us what you'd like us to know. Well, uh, buckle up. <laughs> no, it's uh, like uh, like with most enthusiasts in this hobby, in this community. For me, it started as a child. Um, you know, my father was a proverbial hunter, fisherman, do-it-yourself kind of man. Uh, growing up in rural Eastern Oregon, <clears throat> there's a lot of things that you have to do with your hands when you grow up in ranch land. So my family didn't have a ranch, but all my neighbors did. And okay. I frequently helped out on their properties. Uh, we were always renovating or building something. So right around the age of six years old, uh, I started to notice that every everywhere my dad went, he had a pocket knife and it was either a backlock buck knife, or it was one of these, you know, slip joint knives. But I was fascinated because he was always the person who would fix things. If something was broken, he would fix it. And the first time I saw him cut something with a knife, uh, it, I was blown away, you could say. And I was fascinated at six years old. So I found out where he kept his pocket knives. It was in his bedside bedstand drawer. And, you know, the curious mind of a six-year-old that's still figuring out right from wrong. Uh, I got into that drawer one day when he was at work and I borrowed one of his pocket knives. And I thought I was real slick uh, because I thought I had gotten away with it. But if you don't know how to handle a pocket knife, especially a slip joint knife, you will inevitably cut yourself. Yes, you will. And so that's how <laughs> I got it. And uh, you could say that my parents were very unhappy. <clears throat> uh the mom was especially unhappy because, you know, her little her little boy had just cut open his thumb. And my dad was more upset that I didn't ask. And so it was one of those teaching moments, you know, a right. teachable moment uh, about right and wrong, about asking people before you borrow their things. But also that a knife is not a toy. The, ir- the irony behind that is, is that now my desk is full of these knives. And, uh, you know, the way that we talk about them, the way that we handle them, you could see them as adult toys. Lo and behold, um, I really wanted a knife of my own. My dad knew that. And so my seventh birthday was coming up and much to my mother's chagrin, I got a knife. And, uh, the argument that he made was 
He will never learn how to respect a knife for what it is unless he has one of his own. And so that was 27 years ago. And I still have that today. It's this guy right here. Right on. It's a little fixed blade. And uh, I was through the moon. And the first thing I did was take it outside and start carving up wood like I knew what I was doing. (laughs) And of course, I did not. And then the knife got dull because it's cheap steel. And uh, so I tried to sharpen it and I dinged it up really, really badly. And uh, for a while after that, you know, it sat in my drawer because I was ashamed of the fact that I didn't know how to sharpen my knife. And uh, it it bothered me. I get a little bit older uh, to the point where I can start working. And uh, in high school, right around the age of 16, especially in Eastern Oregon, I'm sure you're aware, especially with the fire summer you guys have had. Mm -hmm. uh, One of the jobs you can get as a 16 year old is called fire camp. Fire camp is essentially uh, wildland firefighter support. And so that's when I decided to get another pocket knife. The pocket knife that I got was by Kershaw. And I looked it up because at the time I just went to the local Ace Hardware and I picked up whatever looked cool, which happened to be a Kershaw. And the model name is Needs Work. <laughs> that's the, name of the model name, Needs Work. And I don't know who workshopped that name, but it was a bad <laughs> name. Uh, I didn't look at it. But if you look up the Kershaw Needs Work, you'll see what I'm talking about. It's a Warren Cliff assisted flipper. And, uh, you know, I look at that now and I can't believe how far we've come. But I used that knife every single day that summer in fire camp because we were constantly popping open boxes. Uh, we had to cut rope, cut twine. A uh, few occasions we had to dispose of fire hose for the, the firefighters, um, especially when we were rolling the fire hose at the end of a fire. Sometimes we'd find holes and we'd have to make sure that the Forest Service understood that that hose is done. Uh, So cutting hose was another thing that I used it for all the time. And so that summer, I really got used to using and carrying my knife every single day. And, uh, you know, the value of a sharp edge really started to show itself to me. Um, Later on, after high school, I was getting ready to go to college and, uh, you know, I'd had the fire camp experience. And so I decided to join a wildland firefighting crew and the pocket knife is such a a useful tool for people in that field because you're constantly needing to do things that requires you to cut. And, uh, so I carried that Kershaw needs work and, uh, you'll laugh about this, but the screws came out and instead of finding replacement screws or reaching out to Kershaw because I could have, they would have replaced those screws. I just gorilla glued the screw holes. (laughs) (laughs) And, uh, it it remained working. And so, you know what, it, it was, uh, it was a great experience. So that's awesome. So, so, Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say a little, a little thinking on the fly there. <laughs> Thank goodness it was a Kershaw. You know? Right, right. If someone told me that they had done that to their Chris Reeve, I might, I might lose it. <laughs> but so I, I left for college and uh, in college, I decided that I wanted to get into uh, YouTube and I'd had some experience. I did some uh, radio classes that got me on the air when I was in high school. Uh, but in college, you know, full blown adult, I could start applying for jobs, but almost nobody is hiring in college towns because they don't believe you're going to stick around. One of the part-time jobs that I had, and I had three was working at the local radio station and, uh, they hired me to do drive time radio on Sundays and we would pre-record our voice track. It's called voice tracking. And that's what got me to using equipment like uh, high-end microphones and soundboards and becoming comfortable knowing that at any point in time, someone, you could be at the grocery store and hear yourself on air because all of that stuff is pre-recorded, right? which is bananas. But <laughs> it got me used to, you know, speaking on a microphone. And then I thought to myself, you know, voice tracking is boring when you know what song is going to come up next and you have to, you know, you have to introduce it time and time again. And so I started looking at YouTube and I was really, really intrigued by YouTube because it was right around then, around 2000, 
2009, 2010, YouTube was in the middle of a boom. People were making it their full-time jobs. The, uh, the platform was starting to look more and more legitimate. It was crazy. People were flocking to it. And so I started a channel in my dorm room and I couldn't figure out what to call it. And so there I was with my roommate and I was like, well, should we call it this? Well, no, he wanted to call it something else and said, you know what? Let's rock, paper, scissors for it. <laughs> right on. <laughs> and, and he won. And so he got to choose the name and he said, you're going to call it Rochambeau. But of course, you know, with every username under the sun already being taken, uh, the correct way to spell Rochambeau was already taken. And so I it's like, you know what? No one knows how to spell this word anyways. So I spelled it roll shambo and I started the channel and I didn't have a direction for it. Uh, I did some tech reviews. Uh, I was really big into the hookah community. If you know what a hookah is. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I did some hookah reviews and there was no direction for the channel. There was no niche. Nobody knew what the channel was about because it was all over the place and I was busy doing other things. And so I let the channel kind of go. And so for years, Ever since about 2010, I didn't do anything with the channel. And it sat there with this directionless content. Well, long story short, I'll, I'll fast forward. Uh, I moved away from the Pacific Northwest to find fortune because college towns are not a great place to start a career. So I moved to Colorado. Okay. And, uh, you know, so I did a number of different things here in Colorado. And then COVID hit. And I was stuck at home, like a lot of different people. I was told you got to stay home in quarantine. And so I had a $50 gift card for my, my birthday. And I was like, what can I spend this $50 gift card on? And I looked around and I thought, you know what I haven't had in a while? I haven't had a new knife. So I, there I am shopping on Amazon and I pick out a knife and I was so stoked to get it. It's not even a good knife now. And I know that now. And, uh, but while I was waiting for it, I decided to see if there was a review of that knife on YouTube. Right. That's really what opened me up into the enthusiast world was looking for a review of this knife. And I stumbled into channels like Stasa 23, Metal Complex, mm -hmm. Neves Knife, uh, Nick Shabazz, of course. And I started watching their content and it was really fascinating to me, the fact that they could deep dive. And I never really thought about knife steel as anything more than stainless or non-stainless steel mm -hmm. until that point. And I started to realize, wow, there's a whole rabbit hole that I can get lost in on this topic. Why is M390 so, so sought after? What is CPM S30V? What is, you know, so on and so forth. Why are these knives so dang expensive? <laughs> right. <laughs> and, uh, and so I have a, I have an obsessive mind. And so I started doing the research and I started watching more content, watching more content. And then I'd leave these paragraph long comments on these channels videos. And it became one of those things where during COVID, I just started eating up all of the content. And I started to learn a bit more, get a few more knives, learn a bit more, get a few more knives. And I started to realize early on that I could either I could either leave a two paragraph long comment that the person that runs that channel probably won't respond to, or I could start making my own content. And so I deleted all of my old directionless videos on the channel. I almost deleted the old channel altogether, but I looked at it and I said, this is unfinished business. This is a dream that I can't really back away from now. Um, I can, I can delete the channel and start over or I can finish what I've started. Right. So I deleted all the old content. That's why if you look at my channel's birth date, it says that it's like 16 years old or something. I haven't been making knife content for 16 years. I've been making knife content for a little over two years now. And what I learned in that time <clears throat> was that the more you do something, the better you get, uh, the better you get, the more you understand how little, you know, and so two two years and some change later, I'm still learning a lot. I'm still learning about the direction that I want to take with the channel. Um, but I'm really excited about its future and that's how we got here. Right on, right on. 
So that is so cool. I love uh, love hearing you know kind of kind of all the backstory and getting up to up to that. Um, and uh, it's interesting how I've, I've talked to a number of people who have kind of played around with YouTube a time or two, you know, just just having a little fun monkeying around. You know, and then years later, come back and for whatever reasons, decide to jump back in with both feet, you know. So it's interesting that you kind of went through that as well. So that's cool. Uh, do you remember your very first video that uh, that you put up? <laughs> yes, I do. I was terrified mm-hmm. because not because I wasn't I, not because I hadn't made videos before I had, but because I was afraid of failing. And I think that that's a common fear. And I was afraid of failing so spectacularly with my face on camera, you know, when the criticisms come in, you know, they, they show you how secure you really are with yourself. Mm -hmm. And so my first video, my very first video, uh, was on a Chavez Ultramar Redention, Redention. I know I'm probably getting that name wrong, but, and I was, I was nervous. So I had headphones on. And I didn't like the way that my face looked. And so I had these big old sunglasses on the big old visor, the, you know, I shout love, out the Viper. Sunglasses. I love, love the pit Vipers, man. I thought that was a great look. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know who I was trying to be. Um, or, you know, if I was just trying to fool myself, but the only way to really get into it is to jump in. And yeah, that yeah. was a video that, you know, when I look back at it now, I or realized that I really hadn't committed at that point. You know, because if I failed, I could just act like it never happened and nobody, nobody saw my face anyways. Um, but shortly after I did that episode, I realized you either got to commit or delete it all forever. You know, yeah. you can't, you can't half-ass it. Otherwise you'll never move forward. And so after that, I stopped doing the the headphones. I stopped doing the sunglasses. I decided that what really mattered was the quality of the content. Uh, not whether or not someone judged me because they didn't like the way my face looked or because I, they thought my ears were too big or whatever nonsense. And, uh, so I look back at that video and I use it as inspiration, <clears throat> not because I think that it was a bad video, but because it shows the the growth of the channel and the direction the channel has gone. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'd say that anybody out there who's looking at starting a channel who, whether it's on knives or anything, you know, don't delete your first video. Keep it as motivation. Keep it as inspiration. 100%. And if you hit a rough spot a year later, go back and watch six it. months, later, go back and watch it. Yeah. Uh, that kind of motivation. Once you realize how far you've come after you've done, you know, a dozen videos, 50 videos, a hundred videos. Um, it's, it's priceless. Yeah. Even if nobody else watches that video, but you, whenever you need that extra motivation, it's worth it. Yeah, it really is. And uh, you've obviously been doing this a lot longer than I have, but I just know in the short, um, I think roughly about seven months that this channel has been going um, at the time that we're recording this. I mean, we were just talking about a little bit before we started what a learning process it's been. Um, And you really just have to go through it. I watched your very first video, actually a couple of times in the last few days, actually. We watched it on the big screen last night. And, um, I, that's something I did before I ever committed to starting, you know, my channel is when I was just kind of trying to process the, should I do this? Shouldn't I do it? Kind of a thing. Cause I had real issues with getting in front of a camera. Um, and that, that's a whole, whole, whole episode all into itself. But, um, so I was trying to take a look and, and what do I want to do and how do I want to do it? If I'm going to do this, I intentionally went and looked at probably 20 or 30 different channels. And I intentionally went back and looked at their first content. You know, what did it look like? These are channels that I've gotten to know over the years, right? So I know what their current content is and I know how it's changed, but not always do you go back to somebody's very first content, especially when they start to get, you know, hundreds and thousands of videos, right? It can take a minute to go all the way back. And uh, I, was uh, impre- I was impressed with, 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 with your video, Kelly. And uh, the one thing, well, I mean, this is intentional um, that I wanted to bring this up because um, I didn't want to go table down and then put off coming out face forward for a long time. And in that early research that I did, I'd say probably 80 plus percent of most people in the knife community, they, and, 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 and this is, you know, I think the knife community and, and what we do now has changed in the past four or five years. But the trend that I saw was pretty much everybody was on the table 
for months and months, if not years, before they ever did a face forward. You're one of the few people I found, sir, that from what I can tell from the appearance of your channel, you came out face forward first, as did mm -hmm. I. And for me, it was like, if I couldn't come out and do that first, then I would never get the channel what I wanted to do, you know? And so that's one of the things I wanted to ask you about, because it was kind of a deal for me. Was that intentional for you to come, come out face forward and, 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 and to do it, it right out of, right out of the gates? It was, uh, I saw it as an accountability, uh, an accountability piece, because when you look at it, it's all top down content. And if you were to look at the comment sections of some of my earlier videos, some people didn't like that. It, it was kind of a, sh a shake up of the status quo. There was a few channels that were doing some forward facing content, everyday minimalist. I don't know if you've checked out his stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, he does it and, uh, he was, but he was one of the few. Uh, shortly after I started doing it, and I won't say that I was the catalyst for this. I, you know that would be that would be arrogant, but I would say within four to eight months after I started making that kind of content, where I included a front-facing uh, camera angle of myself, we started to see more channels doing that. And I think that for me, I wanted to do it for two reasons. First was accountability. You know, there was a whole scheme on Nick Shabazz's channel about. You know, can you see his face? And he turned it into a theme. Mm -hmm. And to this day, I don't think anybody aside from people that know him personally have ever seen Nick Shabazz's face. And that's okay. That's his right to privacy, whatnot. I think that as a genre or as a niche within YouTube that people aren't necessarily willing to admit, but they're afraid to put their face out there. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's real when you're, that's your real face. Um, but... When people can see uh, when you're talking, it gives you the opportunity to be genuine. It gives you the opportunity to take accountability for the words that you're saying. And while some people want to just focus on just the table down content where you see the knife, you talk about the knife, they hear the voice, being able to see a face and put a face to the name, to the voice, uh, to the content uh, really takes accountability for the fact that when I recommend something, people are going to know what I look like. They're going to right. know what I sound like, and they're going to know that what I say is genuine. 100%. And that's something that's important to me because I think that we have a responsibility when we talk about these things that people spend thousands of dollars on, sometimes monthly. That accountability is important. Um, but also, it was important for overcoming the fear of even doing it in the first place because I decided after that first video, if I truly can't show my face... Uh, then I can't make something that I can look back on later and be proud of. Right. And so that was a personal choice for me. Yeah. Well, and, that, and then thank you for sharing that. And like I said, I, I had my own sets of issues and stuff I was trying to work through in that regard as well. And uh, no, I, I agree with you 100%. And uh, I know that was really important for me as well, because it wasn't necessarily for this channel, but for the business channel. And I was kind of in a position there where I, I, I didn't really have much of a choice. I had to do it there. Um, and it was like, I had to get that comfort level up, but like you said, you've got to have that, that connection, especially in the business world. Right. So, um, obviously you can be very successful doing, doing this in the knife community table down. Many have, you know, but, uh, yeah, that's cool. Thank you for sharing that. Like I said, that was, that was one of my deals. And, and you were, you were one of, I'd say probably 10, 10, 15% of the channels that I, I've discovered that started out that way. So. Good on you, dude. Yeah, thank you. You know, most channels still do table down only. And mm -hmm. and I get it. Uh, you know, I learned later on that <clears throat> the focus is always on the whatever you're showing. And mm -hmm. table down makes sense for that reason, especially on something as small as a knife. Because, for example, if I just show the camera a knife like this, mm -hmm. you can't really see all the same details as if it was zoomed in Correct. from the top. Down. And so I get that. I do think that something that channels, especially newer channels get wrong is they, they think that it's all about whatever they're showing and that's part of it, but people come for the knife, but they stay for the person that's presenting it. Yeah. The person that talks about it. If you look at the really, really successful channels out there, you know, Jared Neves, uh, metal complex, everyday minimalist, they all have a style. What makes their content interesting to watch is not the knife. It's the person talking about it. Very and that so. can get lost in the sauce if, uh, you know, I, I do studies on my, on my channel, 
I deep dive on analytics <clears throat> and I found something interesting uh, at the beginning of the year. I was looking at a ton of different analytics. I was figuring out when people were clicking out of the video, um, you know, at, what was I doing at that time? What was I saying on the camera at that time that got them to click off? And it was funny because I would go into that video and I would look at that timeline. When did they click off? And it always happened at the spec sheet. I said, but people care about the specs of the knife. They care to know how big it is, how much it weighs, what's it made out of. Why is me talking about the spec sheet so boring? What is it? And then I realized when I'm talking about a spec sheet, there's none of me in that. There's no yeah. personality in that. There's nothing entertaining about that. Yeah. And and it's an indicator, you know, that's one of those things that is not personalized. And so when I started taking a look at my content as how do I improve on this? How do I make it more entertaining? Because if I just ignore the spec sheets, people will comment about it and they'll be upset. They'll say, I want to know how much this knife weighs. Right. Well, you didn't talk about the blade steel. <laughs> What's going on here? Do you only fidget with your knives? You know, they start asking questions that can make people really uncomfortable. So you can't ignore the spec sheet, but you also can't necessarily just read it off of a website. And uh, that's one of those hard truths that I had to face is, you know what? Me talking about a spec sheet like a checklist is boring. How do mm -hmm. I make this personal? And then yeah. that's, that was the challenge. Um, but it goes back to, it's not what's on the table that keeps people watching. It's who's presenting it and how they're presenting it and the ability for people to kind of connect with that person. I think you're hundred percent correct when you say that. And I think that, you know, it, it gets talked about a lot, but there, there's a connection. It's the, the ongoing dialogue, you know, and, and that is exactly how um, I got here with pocket talk. It's that ongoing dialogue. And when you get into a channel, um, regardless of, of what it is, and you start following it, you know, it's just like when I start coming into roles lives once a week because I enjoy it, you're now following that personality, right? And, and, and there, there's something to that. And it's the ongoing dialogue. And that's one of the things that uh, when we started doing these pocket talk, people are like, that's cool. I got it. I, I, I get his content. But now we get to hear before that, right? And and so, and I think that you know the, these things all play into it. And um, I think we 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 lived through a strange time, you know, from 2020 till now that really kind of blew all this stuff up. It it uh, it changed, uh, sent us home, and changed the way that we felt like we needed to figure out ways to communicate, right? And um, it's 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 very interesting the community that I stumbled into, but we've got a great community of people here. And uh, said well, it many know, times uh, before, you put this many guys in a room and they get along this well, there's something strange, man. There just is. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, talking about, you know, COVID, you send a bunch of people home, they start drinking and watching YouTube, things will happen. Will. Uh, <laughs> you know, but, but it, that was a huge boom. That was uh, pretty close to around the same time that Chris Reeve Knives saw a massive increase in business. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you look at their if you look at their back orders right now, if you were to order a knife directly from Chris Reeve, uh, an Um Noom Zon would take six years to get to your doorstep. Uh, it didn't used to be like that. You go back to you know 2019, 20 you know early 2020, you could order a knife directly from Chris Reeve, and it would. It would be like ordering from a regular retailer. You do that now, I mean, there's almost no point to buy something directly from them. You need to go through a retailer. Otherwise, you know, you're you're just waiting for a long time to get a knife. But uh, coronavirus, COVID shot a lot of a lot of hobbies through the roof, and it wasn't just really the did. knife community; it was a lot of different communities. It, but it what was. was really neat is is that it gave people a chance to connect over thousands of miles away mm -hmm. um what blows me away especially on my live streams is finding out where people are mm -hmm. you know there's people in hawaii there's people in thailand there's you know there's someone in turkey yeah. and uh and the the live streams are a lot of fun because it gives me an opportunity to do organic raw content you know because if i do an episode of steel snobs you know that's a heavily written investigative journalistic piece 
you know, people know that I've researched the crap out of that topic. If I do a knife review, I'm carrying the knife for several days before I get on camera and talk about it. But if I do a live stream, I never know what anyone's going to say in the chat. And uh, it, it creates a kind of a raw moment. Especially and, when they uh, start busting on you about raisins. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I, I hate raisins. No. Uh, I hate raisins. And, and with that, I'm <laughs> going to uh, enjoy this nice peanut butter cookie here. Right on, right on. A little snack break there. So, no, it really is. Um, I, I know that when I first started doing my lives, I had them pretty scripted out in the sense that I had everything laid out. I didn't want to forget everything. You know, my link sheet and stuff that I sent Zach, who was going to come in and moderate for me and, and whatnot. I mean, he had to be looking at that thing. And, well, freaking Mark lost his marbles, man. But, you know, I mean, at the time, like you said, you, you, you had to do what you had to do to get comfortable to get through it anymore it's just kind of like i kind of you get in your head this is what i want to talk about i got this package or that package but it, it's kind of like it, i think just going without a plan almost for me has gotten to be where it's more fun you know it's, it's, it's more natural more organic the interaction is better usually it seems like so the way that i approach it because there's very few people in my regular day-to-day -day life that I can, you know, pull out the latest knife acquisition and be like, have you seen this thing? This thing is fantastic. And they'll understand. There's very few people. But if I go into my live stream, I can be like, guys, have you seen this crazy new prototype? And people will get excited about it like I get excited about it because right. we're, all, we're all knife nuts, right? So what I learned early on was, if you talk to the camera like you're talking to a friend, then it's natural and organic mm -hmm. and it'll be a conversation that flows. People stutter and they say, uh, or mm, when they don't know what to say or when the natural word track in their brain gets interrupted by not feeling self-confident about what you're talking about. But how often have you talked to a friend about anything that you have in common with them and you, you catch yourself saying, um, or you don't do that because it's a natural conversation between two friends, right? My live streams. I think it's, I think it's really crazy that you mentioned that because my live streams, if you look at some of my earliest ones and I haven't deleted any of my live streams, if you sort them by oldest, I tried to do that where I had a theme of what I would talk about. And it started off with, I used to do something called grail or garbage and I don't do it anymore because it was a series that never took off. It took a long time to produce and it just wasn't worth it. Uh, but I, when I started to do my live streams, I said, wouldn't it be cool if I did some of these live, you know, maybe people would really get into that. And if you look at some of my earlier live streams where I tried to do that, I kept getting knocked off course by the chat. And my first reaction was, how do I, how do I make it so that people don't expect me to re respond right away? You know, I want to talk about this. And I, I had to really look at myself and say, what do you want out of a live stream? You want an opportunity to connect with your audience in a raw way that's organic, where it feels like a conversation between two friends. Why am I trying to, why am I trying to format this to be anything other than that? Because that's right. the real joy, you know, being able to share the hobby with other people, your passion for it. That's what we're all here for. And trying to script a live, a, a live stream is one of the worst things anybody can do, but you can only find that out by trying to do it mm -hmm. and so 100%. now my live streams uh the only theme that i have on my live stream now is i'll choose a title for the live stream to prompt questions in the chat you know the one and done you know the the cookie coalition uh, right you know, <laughs> and, and it's funny because people will look at the title of the live stream there oh we're, he's definitely going to talk about this well maybe maybe yeah. maybe not yeah. Yeah, and uh you know It'll tell you what a good a good live stream title is is when people pick up on it and then they they run the narrative, you know. I, and then I, then you just become the person that's you know in their story, and that's almost yeah. even more fun. Well, exactly because uh, if you came in with preconceived notions or a laundry list, and the chat comes back at you so hard, they start to dictate the narrative. Um, <laughs> one, you're about ready to have a good chat, but you might as well quit trying to follow your list. And that's what I learned really really quick early on 
it was like, I think week two or week three, it was like, boy, I was prepared. I had stuff I was going to go through. I was ready to go. And then the chat started to interact. And I was like, ooh, I didn't account for this. <laughs> two hours and 45 minutes later, I was like, well, maybe we're not going to get through the rest of the list today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, the list. It was it was a great idea. Just, yep. you know, chug it out the window and, and and hang on, you know, but that's the fun of it all. And it's it's not for everybody. You know, uh, I look at, like I said earlier, I look at the analytics all the time. And what I've noticed is, is that it's a very small percentage of my viewership watches the live streams. But what's really interesting is the amount of people that come back and watch the live stream and never partake in the chat. Uh, but someone might watch the same, they'll, they'll watch a live stream like 20 times. And on the 21st time, they'll join the chat. And I've always wondered, why is that? And I think that it goes back to having that fear of putting yourself out there. Mm -hmm. Because if you know that that person running the live stream could highlight your chat and then respond to you, you can't, once it's out there, you can't take it back. Yeah. And so I think that it's really interesting how many people loyally watch live streams, but never enter the chat until they finally do. And then when you, you know, you reward that by responding and creating that rapport back and forth, there's several people that I've never met in real life, but I know details about their life. And it's crazy. Uh, my wife was commenting on this. She was like, why are you talking about cookies in your live stream? You have a knife channel. What's up with these cookies? And then, you know, and then I'm getting grief from her. She brought home boxes of raisins. She already knew I hated raisins, but she heard it on my live stream. Uh, you know, and that's, that's crazy. Because it comes that, down that, to that, that cost me a lot of money to track her down and pay her to do that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it was you. Oh, it was I, you. I wish that was only true. <laughs> I just, I, I just don't like raisins in my cookies. You know, you can sneak them into some stuffing and Thanksgiving and I can pour enough gravy on them to be okay. Yeah. But I won't choose raisins. There you um, go. Nor do I think you but, ever should, because trust me, I have plenty of food stuffs <laughs> that I'm not going to try. It's just not going to happen. They're done. So uh, I'll, I'll guarantee if anybody's wondering, he's got the pass on razors, raisins from me, people. He, he does. So <laughs> he's been a great sport about it, too. So <laughs> I, I appreciate it. Man. I appreciate it. But. You know, I guess the, the theme of the conversation would be that, you know, even though we talk about knives and that's what brings everyone in the hobby together, what keeps people on the channels, you know, my channel, your channel, um, you know, all the channels is the person behind the camera, whether you can see their face or not. Um, it's always that person, that individual that brings them coming back. And I think that that's important to touch on because there's a lot, we're seeing a lot of new channels out there you know, people just starting off with a handful of videos and I try to be open and I try to help people as much as I can, but there's something that everyone has to learn. And that is you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable being yourself on camera. Yeah. Yeah. No, hundred percent. And that, that kind of leads to an interesting question. What have you gotten comfortable being on camera? And I'm going to go out on a limb and assume the answer is mostly at this point. And follow it up with a second question back to back. How long did that take for you? Am I comfortable on camera? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, sometimes I'm too comfortable and I'll say something really crazy and I'll realize sometimes inside thoughts should remain inside thoughts. <laughs> um, how long did it I've take? I've lived with that problem all my life, dude, whether I'm on camera or not. <laughs> So I'm, I'm kind of OCD about some things, and, yeah. uh, you know, uh, I'll say this, the fear of being judged over what I say has never truly gone away, yeah. but the confidence in myself to handle the criticism that might come from that has grown. Okay. Uh, so I'm comfortable with that. I've become comfortable with being uncomfortable. I would say it took about a hundred videos and putting anywhere in the realm of an hour to six hours of work in on each video, because you, when especially for me, you know, cause I don't just record with my cell phone and call it a day. You'll notice I don't do unboxings very often on my channel. That's cause I like to know what I'm talking about. So I do photography and then I'll do a recording and then I'll produce it and then I'll edit it and then I'll upload it. And that turns into somewhere in the realm of two hours on a good day where everything goes smoothly 
upwards of six hours if I have to re-record the same episode three or four times uh, to get my point across because sometimes the conversation in my head does not make itself aware on camera or it doesn't make itself in, uh, it doesn't make its way into the episode. And when I've realized that that you know I had all of these things I wanted to talk about that didn't get there, that's when I the perfectionist comes out and I'm like, nope, delete, re-record. Right. There's no going back. So I'd say about a hundred videos. Okay, cool. And uh, do you know about how far? Or let's see. I've got you right here. You're about what? Just under seven hundred. It looks like six sixty five. It looks like yeah. t- time we're recording this, and you're just just under ten thousand subscribers. So, and that's a yeah. little over two years, right? About two two and a half years, yeah. not quite two and a half years. So. Yeah, correct. And uh, believe it or not, at least in if, if you look at other channels in other niches, you know, uh, they would look at my channel and say, how have you come out with so many videos? Because that would be considered a ton. Uh, but if you go and you look at any of the known channels out there, they've got thousands of videos. Mm -hmm. Uh, we were talking about this before the show. And that is, uh, a lot of, a lot of people look at it. Like I got to put out a video a day, got to put out two videos a day. I, everyone's taking that, that stance. I believe that that's great, especially for people trying to get comfortable in front of the camera. But once you are, for me, I can't do it because I have to care about the content that I'm making. I've got to be interested in it. I'm at the point where I, I'll turn down perfectly great collaboration opportunities just so that I can make continue to make content about knives that I'm interested in and not just because I got it for free. Yeah. Uh, you'll notice I, I haven't done a CJRB collaboration and almost a year. That's, uh, that's intentional. It's because I checked out so many of their knives and they didn't come out with anything that, that really interested me after that. And so I started turning them down because I wanted to care about the content. And once I started creating content that I cared about, I learned that it was a lot easier. You know, it's, it's easier to be, to make good content when you're genuinely excited about it. Um, so that would be some advice I would give to anybody who's newer out there, who's watching this, you know, if you're wondering, you know, how do I make great content? Make sure that it's something that you're genuinely interested in, because if it's boring to you, it'll be boring to everybody else that watches. hundred percent. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting. Tobias Gibson was talking about that in his channel this morning. Um, I was up here prepping a little bit and uh, was, had that on and listened to it. And that's one of the things he was saying, which was, just you, you, you have you have to buy, talk about, share the stuff that you're interested in. Because if you're just pushing stuff across there that you have no interest in, you're going to get exactly what you're talking about, which is it, it's it's going to not come across well for you or the consumer. <laughs> so yeah, wow. so I mean, it, you know, you could make two thousand filler episodes, you know, two thousand you know boring knife reviews, and it won't won't help your channel but what really yeah. grows people's channels when they start really investing uh in making sure that the content they're making is on things that they're interested in yeah. um and the what's funny to me is i i try not to compare my channel to other people's channels but when i when i took a snapshot of where i was uh versus where some other channels who started alongside me were and i looked and i saw you know I've invested four to six hours per episode over 700 episodes. And I thought that was a lot. And then I look at other channels and they're 2000, 2000 videos in and I'm neck and neck. And I'm like, well, you know what? Maybe, maybe it was all right. Maybe yeah. it was all right because I may have made, you know, half as many videos, but I made just as many videos that I cared about as right. they did. And that, that's where you can see the difference. Right. Well, and in, in, in the quality, you know, that comes across in, in when you take the approach that you've taken. And, and I think everybody has to find their place. You know, not everybody is going to go through the trouble of getting away from their cell phones, learning a camera, learning XLR microphones, you know, learn, learn, learning the control boards, you know, and going through all this. Tech. And, and, and nor do I think everybody should. And I think that's dangerous to tell people they have to do it. But the trade-off oh, is yeah. is that the quality, you know, the quality that you get out of a camera with a decent sensor in it over a cell phone. We were talking about this earlier. It's just it's just amazing. And but it changes the way this stuff works, you know. It, 
Well, you know, I, this is something that I learned because when I first started, I 100% went with a high quality microphone and I went with a high quality camera because part of my brain told myself, you'll never be successful if the quality of your video and audio isn't top notch. And that was, you know, that, that's a fallacy. Um, and I learned that that was a fallacy because if you look at some of the most successful channels at that time, you know, Nick Shabazz, Metal Complex, Neves Knives, none of them were using anything that was remotely like impressive. They're using their phones, maybe a lapel mic. Right. Um, and when I figured that out I was like, okay, well, what makes them successful? It's their dialogue. It's the fact that it, when I watch one of their videos, it feels like I'm sitting down with a buddy and we're talking knives, you know, that's cool. Right. Uh, so it's the personalities that really carry the show there. Uh, I had a, I had a crossroads where I almost just, you know, I, I almost hung up the mic and the, the camera and said, you know what, you know, I'll just shoot with my, my cell phone. I decided not to, and I'll tell you why I decided not to, because I know that every single channel on YouTube has a shelf life. Some might be very short shelf life. You know, some might be like military rations where they last forever. And so whenever that day comes where my expiration date, you know, comes up, I want to be able to still look back on my, on the body of work that I put in and be able to, to watch my channel as a spectator and be proud of the work that I see there. And so for me, the reason why I continue to strive for higher quality audio, higher quality video, higher quality content in general is because I want to be proud whenever that day comes where people decide that Roll Shambo is not necessarily what they want to watch on YouTube anymore. And when that happens, I, uh, I'm fairly confident that I'll be happy about what I can see there. Right on, right on. And I think that's a great approach. You know, we talked about it a little bit before, but, um, you know, it's the quality that you bring and the work you put into it. Um, you know, and you know, you're not putting out as many videos, but, uh, you're probably putting in the same amount or more time, um, and you're getting equal or better results. Right. So, and like you said, when it's all said and done, you want to be proud about it. And I think regardless of who, who chooses to use what cameras or equipment, that's, that, that's really the important thing is here is to be proud of what you're putting out. You know, if you're a channel, you're a creator. So, and uh, I, I, I enjoy your content and, and I look very much forward to it. And I'm not surprised at all that that's your philosophy. So, so thank you for being you. I, I really enjoy your stuff. So. Hey, thank you. I appreciate that. You betcha. Um, what kind of, uh, you know, you mentioned earlier um, as in, in our conversation here that, um, you know, you have some stuff that, uh, you know, obviously we've talked about how, how, how your channel has evolved and you've learned. Um, but you mentioned that you, you have some, some goals or some thoughts or some ideas, you know, moving forward, um, any, any, any kind of super secret stuff or, or just any kind of changes that you want to throw out there and let people know, or are you going to just kind of let them happen and, and, <clears throat> and let people see them and experience them as, as they come about? You know, I, uh, I don't make it a secret. I would love to do this full time. Um, I would love to work for myself. I already know what it's like to put in you know, a ton of hours. The channel is one of those things that uh, puts me in the position where I have to burn the candle on both ends to make it work. You know, I have, uh, I have a, a newborn. Well, they're not really newborn anymore. They just turned a year old. My daughter just turned a year old. And then I have a full-time job and then I'm a family man. And so the channel is one of those things where I fit in where I can. And then I spend the rest of the day at my day job wishing that I didn't have to. Um, not because I hate my day job. I actually really like yeah. it, but my ultimate dream has always been to work for myself. There you go. So the, the driving path of my channel is to potentially make that a reality. Mm -hmm. And right. I can't do that unless I, unless I put in the work, unless I find ways to continue to evolve. Um, it's an interesting segue from the topic of doing less videos when everyone else is trying to do more. Right. Um, but I would love to do more steel snobs content. Uh, that's kind of the, the baby of the channel. And it's funny, I've only done 10 steel snobs episodes in a year and a half. Um, <laughs> so I, I might do one of those for every 20 or 30 knife reviews that I do. And, uh, but each time I do one, I, it, it creates a piece of content that lives for a long time. Yeah. Um, last episode that I did, I, I don't know if you saw it was, uh, yeah. S30V is dead. And that was one of the, that was one of my 
favorite episodes that I've done to date because I knew how I wanted to approach it. And it turned out to be a reflection of my opinion on the steel, but it gave me an opportunity to uh, give kind of the story behind the steel and, and dig into it. And I had several people say, you know what? It doesn't matter if you do one of these per month, you have to keep doing these. Uh, this is the way forward. And when you listen to people, uh, when you get that kind of feedback, you have to listen to it. Mm -hmm. So for me, I'm not sweating the knife reviews. I do the knife reviews as I, as I can. And the irony is, is that the, the, the less I try to do, the more show up on my table. Um, so it's a natural push pull. Um, but steel snobs is definitely the way forward for my channel. It's the, it's, it's the series that grows the channel the most. A lot of people who watch my knife reviews get to know who I am through my steel snob series. And I've only done 10 of those episodes, which is yeah. crazy. So I know I need to do more of those. Uh, those are the, the, the episodes that people really love to watch. And I know that I need to continue to work on the art of, st of storytelling, because if I can nail that down, then I think that ultimately the rest of the goals that the channel has for growth is, uh, I think that they're highly attainable. You know, this year, my goal was 10,000 subscribers. Looks like I'll most likely knock on wood, be hitting that sometime in November. Uh, next year, the goal is 50,000 subscribers. And, you know, some people might say, you know, you're, you're biting off more than you can chew to which I would respond. It, if you don't reach for it, is it really a goal? hundred percent. hundred percent. Yeah, no, uh, I'm a firm believer in the same thing. It's like, okay, well, I'm pretty sure I can get to get to 20 by then, but 30. Yeah. <laughs> But it's funny that then all of a sudden you go past 30 and say, that wasn't so hard. We're going to be able to get to 50, right? So I, I think it's great, man. And, you know, I mean, you, you're putting a big ask out there calling your shot. But uh, that's the only way you're going to find out whether or not you can get there. And uh, yeah. one thing I, the one thing I can I, I can probably throw out there is even if you don't get there, you're, you're going to, you know, you, if you don't get the perfect 50,000, you're going to stumble across excellent along the way. You know, and, 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 and even if you don't, but if you don't try, you're never going to get there. So, well, it's, it's crazy because, <clears throat> you know, there's average growth. And then what happens when you make really, really good content along the way is that you can have something go viral. Um, I'll, I'll use, uh, I'll use Jared Neves as an example. He was one of the channels that I watched back when he had 5,000 subscribers, you know, and I, I thought that he was, he was one of the, he was one of the most entertaining channels to watch at 5,000 subscribers. And he was growing steadily, growing steadily, growing steadily. And then he made a video on the original Riot XO, the original. And that video got over a million views. And within the span of a few months after that point, his channel skyrocketed. It was like someone flipped the switch. They opened the floodgates and then YouTube said, okay, now we'll let people know that you're really here. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then his, his channel went to, you know, a hundred thousand subscribers, 200,000 subscribers. And when you look at the growth rate of channels, that's what happens is it's the natural progression to eventually making content so good that it cannot be ignored by anybody. And so right now that's what I'm aiming for is getting to the point where the content is so good, where it cannot be ignored. And so on one hand, you could look at it and say, next year's goal of 50K, maybe I hit it, maybe I don't. But as long as the goal that goes alongside that is to make truly good content that nobody can ignore, uh, then you don't have to worry about it because at that point, the community growth at that point is just a side effect of that. Right. Yeah, and what you're talking about is, is doing what you do so well that you experience not consistent growth, but exponential growth. So, yep. yeah, that's awesome. And I think that's a great goal because anytime you're out there trying to put your craft, you know, put your product, whatever it is out there, and you're trying to do it better than anybody, you know, that that, that takes a lot to go out there. Um, you know, but like I said, those are the people that succeed. So not surprised that, that you have seen the, the, the success you have. Um, you know, there's a lot of channels out there have been doing this a lot longer than two and a half years that aren't even close to 10,000. You know, so you're obviously doing something right. And uh, I very much appreciate you taking the time to come in and, and kind of catch us up with, you know, how, yeah. how, how, how did, how did Roll Shambo come to be? 
um, where did it all start and give us a little bit of an insight of where it's going. Um, we're, we're kind of pushing up on about an hour here. Any last thoughts that you kind of want to want to want to throw out there? Maybe tease a little bit. Maybe we can get a few people wanting to come back in for round two on this at some time, and we can go a little bit crazy and share a little bit more info or any juicy tidbits. You know, I'll, I'll say this. I'll say this. Uh, ultimately, the the goal of the channel is is not to get to a certain subscriber count. It's about building a community. Uh, that people can feel like they're a part of and that they're welcome in because that's the that's where you have the most fun in a hobby so that's my goal that's what's going to keep me coming back day after day and hopefully somewhere along the way i can in inspire people and while i can't promise that the channel will reach x amount of subscribers which is what most people get excited about um, what will keep me coming back and what i can promise to people is that I am dedicated to making sure that the content that I put out is not only the highest quality that I'm capable of, but it's also as informative as, as I'm capable of and that it's as entertaining as I'm capable of. And so I would definitely love to come back and do a second episode of Pocket Talk with you. Um, as you know, it's, it's hard to fit these things into my schedule, but where there's a will, there's a way. 100%. And I'd love to uh, have another conversation with you over a cookie again, as long right as on. it's peanut butter and not raisins it's all good we're, we're, we're good with peanut butter we like a variety around here you know the like uh the, the the horrible thing about all that when we're having all that fun with it back in the day i sent you a package and 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 and, and, and got, got it sent to you and I, and I sent you a variety and, and of course there was an oatmeal raisin in there but i i i i acquired uh you know said cookies uh, save uh, the one package from jimmy john's and there was a berry cobbler cookie that when I went in to pick those up for you to send you those was in that package. That was the best damn cookie of all the cookies, right? I don't know if you know this or not. I go back in like a week and a half later to go get a couple more of those because they were so damn good. They discontinued them. They don't make them anymore. How do you make an amazing cookie like that, Jimmy John's, and get rid of it that fast? I'm just saying. Huge mistake. That's how you keep them coming back. You keep them coming back for more. It's we finally – Exactly right. Well, and more importantly, and I sent him a letter that said this, we found a way to get Rolls to sign off on fruit and a cookie because technically it was plain in that wasn't really so much a cookie being fruited as it was a cobbler that was starting to look a little bit like a cookie. You know, I think that a very important debate that needs to be had, and I tr I've, tried, I've tried starting this before. If you don't believe me, try it in your friend group at home. Is a brownie a cookie or a cake? The ultimate. Yeah, see, I mean, you can put yourself in a round groove and, and, and have a hard time solving that question. And if you ask Google, 50% of the results you will find will say that it's a cookie. And the other 50 will say that it's a cake. Because to be a cookie, it has to be a finger food. And brownies are finger foods. However cookies are made out of dough and cake is made out of batter. So I've now I've got a question for you. Is a brownie a cookie or a cake? See, I can make arguments as both, right? And this is the problem with this stuff, depending on, you know, you, you know, you, which way you take it. Yeah, the dough <laughs> versus the batter, it complicates things for my argument. I'm just saying, but um, I don't know. I, I guess to me, I, I'd have to say if I had to pick, I'd say probably brownies. I think more of as a cake like object than I do a cookie. That's they what I said. They, 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 they just happen to usually get cut up into cookie sized pieces. So, you know, if I have to pick a side, I'll say that it, it, <laughs> it's made with a batter. It's a cake. But if you ask five people in your personal circle about that question, just watch their answers and then how how heavily they defend those answers is what's really entertaining right is a brownie a cookie or a cake right exactly and it's all about the entertainment value among colleagues correct absolutely <laughs> right on right on right on so well sir thank you very much and uh I, I i do appreciate you doing this um if for some reason people are watching this and you are not subscribed to the Roll shambo edc channel on youtube please get over there and do yourself a favor and go check him out. He's got fabulous content. Um, he's, uh, he, he, he's not just flapping his gums on here. 
to, to sound important people. He really does this and he really puts the work into it. And he has some of the most amazing content out there in the knife community on YouTube in general out there. Uh, go check him out. Um, make sure you Spartan kick that like button when you're in his uh, lives or checking out his uh, his content and give him that thumbs up out there. And um, Mr. Roll Shambo, thank you very much, sir. I'm going to give everybody the old peace out. And we're going to start to head on out of here until next time.